Hello and welcome to HD's weekly talk show, The Interview. Dr. Shahid Iqbal Chaudhry is among the most decorated IS officers. The first Muslim to join the civil services from the Jammu region, he has done exemplary work in building mountain bridges, tackling terrorism and setting up bunkers along the border. He has bagged many awards for his work, but the most interesting seems to be the happiness award that was conferred on him. Let us meet Dr. Shahid Iqbal Chaudhry in this edition of HD's weekly talk show, The Interview, in our new segment on civil servants. Welcome to the show, Dr. Shahid Iqbal Chaudhry, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you very much. So let me begin with your interesting journey from being a vet to an IAS officer. Just take me through those years. I come from a district, uh, Rajori, which is located on line of control. Uh, it's a remote area and uh, my basic or uh, initial schooling was in a government school. So as I progressed in my education, I moved to the district headquarter, then the capital city of Jammu where I got selection in veterinary science. There's a common entrance test. So being a veterinary science graduate gave me a good option of uh, uh, having a, a career uh, opportunity available. So I tried for civil services and right in my college, in the last year of my college, I clicked for this Indian Forest Service Examination, IFS in 2005 when I completed my graduation. So after that, uh, I just thought of writing civil services examination, IES in 2008 and qualified there. So you've done different levels, being a vet, then Indian Forest Service and then IAS. So how did the switch work? Yeah, and so if you compare the three, yes. what are your uh, So first of all, this is something which I do not suggest to the youngsters that uh, you do something by hit and trial, you go for a graduation, then one service, then other service. So clarity of thought has to come very early. So in my case, like I said, I was preparing for civil services and I tried my hand at IFS and got it in the first attempt. So I joined it. So after joining, I realized that I can uh, just to, uh, I mean, increase the quantum of opportunities which can we get in civil services. IFS is equally good service. So uh, we, I thought of writing uh, the, the civil services examination. So I believe the journey has been uh, uh, full of learning, uh, great experiences. Like in the two years of Indian Forest Service, uh, I could get an opportunity to see the entire country. So every service has its own charm, its own plus and its own uh, this potential to contribute uh, for society. So as a vet, you dealt with animals. Yes. And as an IS officer, you dealt or you deal with human beings. So tell me about the switch and tell me about the experiences. For me, veterinary is very close to my heart because I have spent five years in it. So moving to civil services, it's a 360 degree experience. Uh, I mean, dealing with disaster management, essential services, uh, routine governance and administration affairs. So it's, it's all, altogether a different platform. But some interesting experiences. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, being a veterinary graduate, spending all those five years uh, dealing with animals, their treatment, so it, it brings out a, a human compassion in you, which I think uh, comes very handy in civil services as well. So I think those five years have been uh, very important apart from gaining a first-hand experience of veterinary science. It was important in gaining that empathy, uh, I mean, that curiosity for basic things about feelings, because when you communicate with animals, they, uh, animals cannot talk. So you have to see their feelings, their gestures. So I think that's very important and very handy in communication with humans as well. That sometimes when the people come to you, they are not open. I mean, there are communication gaps, there are barriers. So you try to understand with that instinct, with that experience. So any impressionable incidents while handling animals? If you remember? So dealing with animals was extremely challenging. I mean, those experiences of surgery, I mean, the operations and other things. So dealing with animals was certainly very challenging when you can't speak with your patient. Is this easier? Civil services? Not really. I mean, it comes with, with its own challenges. 
comes with a lot of stress. Uh, I mean, you have to deal with challenges every day. You were conferred the National Award for Gender Justice. Take me through that and your work in that area. Right. Uh, in fact, this was about my work in two, three districts in Bandipura districts of North Kashmir. We worked for girl child education. Uh, I believe that when you are uh, talking about inclusive development and you don't talk about gender justice or, or gender empowerment or equality, so I think you are leaving half of the population out of it. So what we found is that there were large number of girl students out of the school and uh, our district recorded the highest number of girl child uh, out of school students who were brought in formal education. Apart from that, we took internet connectivity to Gurez area, which was uh, not having basic telephone connectivity and internet connectivity. So it was established in 2018. Then we established one-stop centers, libraries in District Rajori and Bandipura. So based on that collective team work, the Ministry of Women and Child Development conferred this National Award for Empowerment. Let me ask you, why is gender so important to you? Were there any childhood experiences or things or incidents those impacted you? to take it through your work later? Uh, talking about my childhood memories or the transition in education, what I've seen is that I think uh, we end up doing up, uh, we end up uh, uh, in our decision making with some biases. The gender bias can be ye kaam male hi kar sakta hai, ye female kar sakti hai. But you, when you go into basics of it, when you go into sociology of it, so I think specifically talking about the gender, the women end up doing more work than we do. Every woman has, a, has, a, has an extraordinary story. Like if I talk about my wife, my, my mother, so I see a lot of uh, stories there, a lot of challenges there. So uh, I feel that gender empowerment, gender inclusion is very important, but uh, somewhere uh, what I have seen is that we do not talk about it. We do not acknowledge it. But have you personally witnessed in your years of growing up gender injustice? And when you talk about stories of your mother or your wife, uh, of course, those are of empowerment. But take me through some. One is concept of gender injustice. What I, I have seen is that I think this is ingrained in our societal norms and values. That there is, there is a particular set of works which is attributed to be done by the women alone. And there is something which is to be done by the men. So that's what I have seen in, uh, in the years of growing up as well uh, as a student in college as well. So I think things are changing right now towards better. So at home, how does it work for you? <laughs> I think it's a fairly balanced system. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you really cook for your wife? Uh, and do you share her duties? Uh, occasionally, but we are sharing, right? Uh, like uh, I do drop my kids to the school before going to my office. When she is going to her office, we both are working. So I think we are sharing responsibilities. I will not say equally because she will be doing much more than me. But uh, apart from being a primary bread earner, uh, I just try to uh, take some of the duties of the family as well. So uh, frankly speaking, I would say women like in my own family or in any family, they do a lot more than us. They perform more than us. They are, they are, they are more, uh, more stressed than us. But uh, I think that's not being acknowledged uh, widely and fairly. Women are more stressed, but it is you who got the happiness award. <laughs> So I think uh, there are roles, there are hidden roles as well. So this happiness award was about COVID-19 management in Srinagar. So uh, apart from a routine COVID-19 management using technology, using uh, other uh, standard operating procedures. So what we did in Srinagar is that we reached out to every single household. One was that we took care of non-COVID uh, emergencies. Like we had a helpline uh, for cancer patients, the diabetics and other uh, like those requiring kidney related uh, treatments. So that received huge response from people. Then on a few particular occasions because it was complete lockdown. So we reached up to children like uh, 10,000, 20,000 families. Then we ran some uh, online classes for them. So we just try to try that uh, this gloom. Uh, I mean, it should not be impacted by our purely bureaucratic or approach for COVID-19 management. So we just tried to be different to bring in some happiness in those times as well. So you use technology in a very effective way in this effort. So just tell me about that. Uh, so when COVID-19 struck us, it was new for all of us. So there were challenges on one part about containment of uh, COVID-19 containing its spread. So second important was that when you are working on COVID-19 management, you should not lose your eye from our routine uh, duties, routine requirements. One is about delivery of essential services, your healthcare, 
water supply, power supply and other things and uh, other is non-COVID uh, patient care, that management. <clears throat> so we established one IVRS call center which was in pipeline but we expedited. So the IVRS call center again came up as a confidence building measure with the citizens. Like if you call over IVRS, IVRS call center, it will be recorded, uh, your grievance is registered, a ticket is generated. So like somebody says that his transformer is damaged. So because people are not able to move, they are not able to go to offices or between homes. So this served as a platform. So when we receive a complaint that a transformer is damaged, so a ticket is raised, it goes to concerned assistant executive engineer and it goes to the complainant as well. So there is a timeline fixed, say six hours, 12 hours for a particular type of transformer. So it is replaced or the damage is repaired uh, and the ticket is closed. Very important point of this technology, what I found is that if uh, my officer, our engineer says that he has replaced a transformer, but the applicant doesn't close the ticket. So it is considered as open and we escalate it and we try to understand why the grievance is still pending. So I think this gave us a bird's eye view of entire city having 1.2 million population. And uh, there was a great satisfaction and great response from people as well. So I think technology in such times really comes with a great help. But don't you think it was a challenge given that people, and I don't mean this critically, given that people there are not tech savvy? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, because uh, we were on a positive side in this, we were dealing this in Srinagar city, I mean, which has uh, uh, every family uh, onboarded on social media as well, but uh, using a uh, IVRS call center uh, contact number, it's very easy for everyone and uh, in those times of COVID, I think communication was the basic underlying uh, uh, pillar of our uh, entire system, our entire response system. So we did not find any problem because picking up a mobile and dialing this uh, number, like we used to receive seven to 8,000 calls every day when we started this facility and then it uh, averaged at around 3,000 to 3,500. So certainly, uh, there are uh, grey areas, there are uh, shadow areas in uh, in rural districts where I particularly find this problem that when you are talking about e-services, uh, e-governance, so there are uh, have-nots. So there is a serious challenge, but in Srinagar, we were fortunate enough that uh, the city was, uh, I consider that the city was tax savvy and uh, I mean, you will find every person on Twitter at least. You know, you have, and let me compliment you on this, you have in a sense broken the mold of the traditional definition of an IS officer. And your approach is not only humane, but it actually works from the ground, whether it's gender justice, whether it's kids, whether it's building bridges. How and where does that come from? What I have seen in all these years of service, like I'm in mean, 18th year of service, including the forest service as well, so what I have found is that if you effectively and honestly communicate with the people you are in charge of for the service and you try to listen, like if we go to a village to hold a camp to tell them about disaster resilience and we want them to take some action. So I think first of all, we need to try to understand somewhere that if they are aware of a hazard and we want them to take a action, what are the reasons that they are not taking that action already? Like if you are making a communication for disaster management, you link it to their apple crop that this will be the kind of damage if you don't adhere to our advisory about heavy snowfall. You link it to their livelihood and so many things. What I have seen is that when you sit with people, when you try to get their feedback, I think there is no training parallel to that for your effective governance. And second is uh, very effective team building. If you empower people, if you uh, try to decentralize things, if you empower people on at the ground level, so I think that has a multiplication effect, enormous multiplication of your efforts is there. You have to trust your team. And lastly, I would say is that we have to come out from our silos. Like if I'm working in a particular department, I should not hesitate going to an office of another officer junior to me in another department if I want something from him. So would you say that the training is contrary to this or doesn't touch this or doesn't deal with it sufficiently as it should? Partly, I would say that when uh, these trainings are conducted, we do call experts from all walks of life. But the ratio of those professionals and those uh, those people having field experience, would, it would be 80, 20 or 90, 10. So I think the training institutions should uh, have such structured programs where the officers, officer trainees, they can have informal communication, informal conversations. And it's more about learning from the experiences. Uh, there is a couplet in Urdu, I'm just trying to recollect. 
कौन सीखता है किसी के तजुर्बे से कौन सीखता है किसी के तजुर्बे से हर किसी को एक हादसे की जरूरत है सो आई थिंक अकेडमी स्टेट इंस्टीट्यूशन शुड कॉल दोज पीपल हु हैव परफॉर्म्ड इन फील्ड विद विजिबल आउटकम्स विद ग्रेटर इम्पैक्ट ऑन पब्लिक सर्विस डिलीवरी सो आई थिंक दैट शुड बी गिवन मोर वेटेज इन ट्रेनिंग एज वेल सो सबको किसी हादसे की ज़रूरत है आपकी ज़िंदगी के कुछ हादसे बताइए हादसे एज सच तो मैं नहीं कहूँगा बट बिकॉज गॉड हैज़ बिन वेरी काइंड माय पेरेंट्स माय फैमिली इन दिस फेज ऑफ लाइफ माय वाइफ चिल्ड्रन सो एवरीवन दे हैव कंट्रीब्यूटेड टुवर्ड्स माय लाइफ बट हादसा क्या है कि बट व्हेन आई लुक बैक ओवर ऑल दिस इयर्स लाइफ हैज़ बीन एक्सट्रीमली सेटिसफाइंग आई मीन मोर देन समथिंग आई एवर ड्रीम्ड ऑफ आई एवर बिलीव इन टू बट अब मैं ये कहूँगा कि लाइफ हिट एंड ट्रायल में बहुत रही जैसे हमने कहा कि वैन आई क्वालिफाइड क्लास ट्वेल्थ एग्जामिनेशन सो आई वॉन्टेड टू जॉइन कोर्स इन मेडिसिन लाइक एवरी वन ऑफ अस यूज टू एस्पायर फॉर इन दोज डेज तो और क्या ऑप्शन अवेलेबल थे वो हमने नहीं देखा वैन आई वेंट टू कॉलेज देन अगेन दिस सिविल सर्विस थिंग कैम इन तो फिर हिट एंड ट्रायल देन आई जॉइन फॉरेस्ट सर्विस देन आई जस्ट रियलाइज दैट आई कुड क्वालिफाई सिविल सर्विस एज वेल बिकॉज आई वॉज प्रिपेयरिंग फॉर दैट तो वो हिट एंड ट्रायल का जो बीच में सात आठ साल का वो रहा इट वॉज इन माई केस आई थिंक इट वुड बी रेयर दैट इट इट क्लिक एट एवरी स्टेप बट इट मे नॉट क्लिक फॉर एवरी वन सो आज के जो बच्चे हैं मैं उनको कहूँगा कि यह हाथ से अवॉइड करें हिट एंड ट्रायल के प्रोजेक्ट राहत वो भी शायद एक हाथ से से इंस्पायर हुआ एंड इट डज हैव स्टैम्प ऑफ योर चाइल्ड हुड बिकॉज यू सो मेनी किड्स डाइंग सो टेक मी थ्रू दैट सो टॉकिंग अबाउट माई चाइल्ड हुड ये ये जो रीजन है वहाँ जहाँ प्रोजेक्ट राहत भी हमने किया सो इट्स टफ टेरेन माउंटेनियस रीजन देर आर स्मॉल रिवुलेट्स जिनका एक कैचमेंट एरिया बहुत ज़्यादा होता है और थोड़ा सा अगर बारिश हो जाए डाउनपोर हो जाए तो देर इज इमीजिएट फ्लडिंग सो आई एक्सपीरियंस जस्ट वंस इन आई स्टिल रिमेंबर द डेट इट वॉज थर्टी फर्स्ट मार्च ऑफ आई थिंक नाइन्टी थ्री और नाइन्टी फोर वन आई वॉज इन क्लास एट्थ तो इसी तरह की फ्लडिंग थी राइट फ्राम माई चाइल्ड हुड इन दिस माउंटेन्स आई हैव सीन दैट इवन टिल डेट when people venture out when they want to cross these rivulets in rainy season so there are many instances of deaths they are washed out uh, uh, the only reason is that they are not predicting the flow of that uh, rivulet it, it it is just abrupt so there were two instances in udampur district which really moved us there was a gentleman in a village called bajin so he lost his three son but irony was that he lost his two son in one year same place and third son another year same place so what we felt is that a bridge could have saved them and then he mentioned that there have been a lot of instances at the at this village then a lady sarpanch from an area called as known as panchari she came to us with a similar uh, point that uh, there are a lot of girl students who do not go to schools in rainy season because of this reason that there have been instances of children being washed away and then we uh, assessed uh, this vulnerability analysis was conducted for entire district udampur in all villages so we found that to be accurate and to be i mean disaster proof i will not say resilient but disaster proof we need to have around 450 to 500 bridges in this district so we started uh, in phase wise manner the most critical areas were covered and we were able to uh, build 170 bridges in just a period of 9 months you build about 400 mountain bridges what were the challenges because mountain bridges are not easy so uh, we learned by our experience and these things evolved like in riyasi district we constructed around 70 bridges which were purely uh, made of uh, wood so these were wooden bridges the drawback with the wooden bridges that uh, the life span is uh, uh, i mean uh, very less and it requires lot of maintenance so then we evolved to uh, aluminium uh, bridges uh, we contacted drdo they supported dehradun based ngo hasco so we got a aluminium aluminium model from them and in mountain bridges we constructed the local abutments using the local material and utilizing the funding which is available under mg narega with local panchayats and then got this material of aluminium alloy bridges which is again uh, it could be launched in just 24 hours time so how many mountain bridges did you build uh, we constructed 170 mountain bridges in udampur around 70 those were of wooden in riyasi and 84 in rajouri district you construct this mountain bridge in just 4 to 5 lakh rupees compared to uh, a regular rcc bridge of around 50 to 60 lakh rupees because a lot of carriages involved and that bridge takes around a year or more to complete and this one will take if abutments are ready it will take just 2 days to launch that bridge and i mean the there is no maintenance required for 30 years if you are just uh, i mean just supervising these bridges 
and these are very good and effective uh, local assets which are being maintained by the local village communities. You've taken up several projects to tackle terrorism. Just take me through that. I think when a, when a huge uh, set of youth is available, I mean, maybe like we have seen so many instances where youth were misguided into militancy, misguided into many other activities. So I think you have to go for a very constructive engagement of youth. Like in Jammu and Kashmir, we onboarded around 5 lakh youth in last two years into our mission youth. If you talk about last year's incidents of uh, Shri Amarnath Yatra, so we had around 300 mission youth volunteers stationed at various camps. So along with our forces, they were the first ones to respond. They were first responders along with the community as well. You talk about any medical emergencies, they are first one to respond. So what makes them to come for this volunteerism? There is some love for the land, for the people. So that is one thing that this base already existed, which required to be supported. So I think you have to bring them towards what I call about positive energy, positive contribution towards national, build, national building. Who would you blame, and I underline the word blame, for what Kashmir has become today? So I think today, uh, we are, if we are talking about Kashmir of today, I see a lot of hope, a lot of empowerment, a lot of positivity in Kashmir. What I see is that uh, a lot of positive engagement has been there on the ground and I think uh, this should have been allowed uh, many, many decades earlier. I mean, when you talk about Kashmir of 1970s, 80s, so everyone uh, of that generation has very good memories. So there were disruptions uh, for many years. So I think uh, the government's contribution has been fairly very positive in its giving dividends, its giving outcomes. Yes, but who would you blame <clears throat> for the state of affairs? So I think as a civil servant, it's very difficult for me to be... Uh, I realized that you were avoiding this. the question. But uh, I would say that there were uh, disruptions, there were uh, I mean, vacuum uh, in many sectors where we, uh, we should have empowered the youth at that level. There were lack of opportunities as well, which the government is not providing. My question still <coughs> remains unanswered. <laughs> Who would you blame? So uh, I said that uh, I will not go into the actual uh, uh, concerns. So there were external forces, there were a lot of uh, uh, insurgency incursions from, uh, from outside Jammu and Kashmir. So the concerns are known to all of us, which we have been tackling for the last many years. For an IS officer, you have great fan following. What is the trick, if you will allow me to use the term? Uh, I mean, the secret is open. Like I earlier said that if you uh, go into the people, if you go and sit with them without any, uh, I mean, your level of seniority in service, your tags about your grades and positions. So if you act as a citizen, they repose faith in you. So I have worked in extremely difficult conditions, be it <clears throat> Bandipura, in Srinagar, Kashmir and so many other places. So, <coughs> sorry. I have never faced any kind of difficulty when uh, reaching out to the people. Like I will just cite a case, there's, a, uh, there's an area called Hajin, which was strictly a no-go area for I mean, senior, senior officers because of its routine law and order problem. So in 2018, along with a colleagues, uh, colleague from police and a senior friend from army, so we started some outreach there in Hajin and uh, we had very huge gathering there in a program. My vehicle was attacked at some other place in uh, same same day, same evening, but uh, the issues they projected, the the points they raised, which we addressed. So I think still they come and visit me just for courtesy call without any work. Everywhere I have seen that when you go to people, when you listen to them, when you hear their issues, when you speak, it's about honest and straightforward communication, not even assurances that you will do some wonders for them. So I think being with them is the most important thing. That when you when particularly in a region, in an area like Kashmir, which has seen the worst of it as well. In a particular district when I joined, so there were just few chairs in the office. So I asked that, uh, what is the system of meeting? I just asked my colleagues that anyone who visits anytime is welcome. I will work the I will work on the files in the evening, but we'll meet the people during the day as well. So the kind of response, the kind of- So you got more chairs? Yes, of course. So the kind of uh, uh, footfall- So if there were three or four chairs, Earlier, mm -hmm. how many does your office have now? I, in a particular district in Rajori, I moved out from my office. I established a tent there. For many months, there was a tent in the lawn having 100, 150 chairs and a lot of people coming there. So uh, experiences have been varying. I mean, when people hear that an officer as civil servant is listening, 
so your i mean your market gets enlarged they come and see you so if you try to uh, respond to them and I, again the quantum is very high but if you address their critical issues they understand uh, that you are responding you are responsive to these issues and they repose faith in you i think this is something which i value a lot about people of jammu and kashmir and uh, it's unbelievably uh, at a very high level the kind of respect the kind of faith they show in you when you listen to them reach out to them and when you address their queries and concerns i don't want to sound communal or make this communal but let me ask you being the first muslim civil servant from jammu what did it change i worked in two districts in kathua district the popul- population of one community is 93% 92% another of 8% so i never found any kind of discrimination in the district rather people loved me more and more and uh, the kind of affection i still receive from kathua uh, again i will say it has very few parallels <coughs> in udampur district when i was transferred again uh, i was from a minority community and the i think 85 90% would be majority community so there were complete ban for 3 days there was strike they blocked the road uh, about uh, against my transfer so then i had to just get away from the district in the middle of night particularly talking about uh, coming from muslim community into ias i think uh, there have been lot of selections after that as well i don't know if that was the effect uh, maybe Uh, seeing the things being possible so particularly coming from a tribe partic- coming from a community it was certainly empowering for all of us and uh, about uh, i mean making it to be possible i mean appearing it to be possible uh, like we do the things seeing others like i have uh, found my aspiration in many people during my school days during my college days so i think somewhere that element also plays a role so you are now a role model for your community uh, i will not say that i mean uh, i will leave it to the community but i just try to be humble to be grounded and to contribute whatever i can dr shahid iqbal chaudhry thank you very much thank you for your time and thank you for being here thank with you us. ma'am i really like this interaction thank you